Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very, very special edition of the Trek Culture Podcast. We, of course, are your hosts, Sean and Ellie. But you're not here for us, you're here for Aaron. And we're going to celebrate the fact that it's Star Trek Prodigy Day, October 28th. Happy, well, happy birthday, Prodigy. And happy birthday, Aaron. <laughs> Even if it's not actually your birthday, I'm going to call it your birthday. <laughs> My birthday was a couple of months ago, but yes, happy birthday, Star Trek Prodigy. You know, uh, when when the fans started uh, saying like, hey, let's get together and have a little day for Prodigy, I was like, I'm for it. So it shall, so it is written, so it shall be done. I want to uh, put a spotlight on Ellie for a second because there is Ooh. not one day in the last however long that she hasn't um, mentioned October 28th. She's been talking about Star Trek Prodigy. She has been keeping the flame I mean, if, if 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 we blink, she's come up with three new ideas for lists and videos and everything. So, um, yeah. So th there's the 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 the, the English um, the, what, the beacons. There you go. That that's that that's Ellie. That is me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're just dropping subspace beacons every so often to, to keep the 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 flames of Gondor lit. <laughs> mm, which reminds me, Aaron, that check still hasn't come through. So, uh, you know. I'll wait for that. <laughs> oh yeah, did... oh yeah. Aaron, we're we're paying you we're paying you an exposure, Ellie. Don't you understand? Oh, <laughs> oh. I hope you never get blue in the face hearing congratulations. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think I speak for everybody on the crew is that it, when I say that we're extraordinarily excited uh, for the show to be on Netflix. You know, for many reasons, it's a, a wonderful home for our series. Um, you know, they have a, a gigantic global audience, especially for young adult animation like our show. Um, and, you know, I, I cannot wait for everybody uh, to see our series, especially people who haven't had a chance to see it yet, um, who for one reason or another didn't have access to Paramount Plus or have been putting it off. And this is their chance. You know, the Hagemans and I have worked with Netflix before and uh, they are wonderful partners in creativity. And uh, I, I sincerely uh, hope that everyone else that gets to see, see the show are excited about it as we are, because, you know, the, this sort of thing does not happen very often. I think that bears repeating uh, that uh, the fact that that we did get uh, a new home is some, as much a testament to the fans as any anybody else. Um, <laughs> that uh, it, it really is an indicator, I think, of how how special this show and especially the fandom is. So thank you. <laughs> we weren't quiet. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, like this is. You know, like therapy was considered at one point or another for how much we were going on about stuff. I think, in fairness, uh, God bless people like you, like my mother, who is just like, Sean, what is a prodigy? You know, you know what, you know, kind of what? Why is this so? She she understands Star Trek and everything. She's delighted. So she's happy. I think she, I think she's happy that we're going to stop going on about save Star Trek prodigy now at this point. Um, I did that when I saw the news that Netflix had had come to the rescue. I mean, you know, I immediately was like, Sean, oh my God, this is amazing. I come running down the stairs. I was like, mom, 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 guess what? Guess what? She's like, what? I mean, Prodigy's been saved. She was like, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, that, now I think that the, the next uh, thing to keep an eye out for, I think, is like, you know, once we have the official release dates for when the, the season one and two drop, then we got to we got to rev up those engines and let everybody know the good news. So so take take a breather, you know, drink some Gatorade and then prepare for round two. <laughs> How early on in the kind of thing, you know, did it look like it was going to be Netflix? Um, I, I can't really speak to that, but I can say that, you know, uh, even when all of this sort of situation began, I, w I felt oddly hopeful because of the, the unique circumstances of a show with that, like Star Trek, which is from such a massive franchise, um, and everything I've already, d you know, mentioned of, of uh, our show already being mostly complete in the second season, and... Uh, the fan base that has already been created. So uh, it didn't surprise me to hear that there were parties that were interested, but, uh, you know, we couldn't really say it was definitely happening until the ink was, you know, dry, as they say. So um, when the announcement dropped, that was the when we, we all know, knew for sure that, you know, it, it was happening. So, and, and we couldn't be happier. That was kind of our number one choice. The planes, what did it? 
They watched out the window. They went, oh, damn, we should save this show. <laughs> I I mean, I, can, I can't confirm or deny that, but what I can say is, like, it felt like almost like Odin's ravens circling over, <laughs> just like, oh, a grand portent of things to come. <laughs> I mean, interestingly enough, you know, uh, even with our, our before Academy was moving forward, like when in the early stages of planning our season and stuff, we we kind of intuitively had our own idea of how we wanted season two to go and what our how our character's journey would go. And, you know, even though in other Star Trek shows in the past, they, they tend to be of a certain perspective of, you know, you already have the seasoned veterans on the ship and they're competent and they and they know their their role and their orders and and whatnot. Uh, I think there there are other elements uh, that we've seen tiny little glimpses of on Deep Space Nine or TOS, you know, of like, you know, how cadets work and how civilians work and how, how that how that line kind of blurs and and how one can beget the other we had a story that that we were we we wanted to and were ready to tell that was that was not necessarily the starfleet academy traditional story you know because it not as we know in star trek not every single uh like O'Brien, for instance, was an NCO and then became the chief of operations. You know, there there are many pa paths to becoming a celebrated member of, of uh, Starfleet, and we wanted to explore all of them if we could. So as this is October the 28th, uh, and it is, of course, probably today, um, we have just either before or after this uh, podcast has dropped, we have just put out our Secrets of the USS Protostar list. Uh, thanks very much to Clive Burrell for writing that and turning it around. What what was the process? What because obviously you have addressed this and probably asked us loads and loads of times, but I've got you now. So what was the process that went into the protostar from the beginning? Did you know we were going to go kind of vaguely arrowhead shaped, reminiscent of Voyager? You know what what was the sort of the genesis of it there? Well, I I was not. Uh involved directly uh, aside from just giving the stamp of approval with the actual designs but what i can say is you know benny bond uh had the by far the largest hand in designing the ship uh but uh, he in the early concepts i believe started with john eaves you know legendary starfleet <laughs> ship designer um and then uh we also kind of talked a little bit about about you know hull shape and that and whatnot and rick sternbach um you know has gone on record several times of saying you know w w when you're when you come to ships that are the fastest in the fleet you know you have ships that are like um uh the the prometheus and um the the original dauntless they tend to have more of an arrowhead shape and he felt like the whole shape itself might have something to do with its ability to pass through uh you know subspace and or the uh the bre you know near or breach the warp barriers and so we 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 just wanted to kind of continue that because that's that's always where we would start anytime we're introducing anything new is like all right what came before and in that sort of evolutionary line what what would feel like it came next where it's hearkening to something uh, new in sort of this new era of the 2380s but feels like it came from what uh what uh uh was implied before and, and i i what's kind of fun on a show like this one is like in in many ways when you're working on a franchise like this it's as much like almost like forensic anthropology as anything else where you have to kind of look because sometimes you don't have the people who worked on tos or tng they're, they're not around to answer your questions anymore but you see there was a thinking there and mm -hmm. between our own internal thinking and also the the fan base is also spent i feel like that's that's the national pastime of trekkies is over analyzing things and creating theories and so there is a number of occasions where we're like, I'm pretty sure, I don't know why I think this, but I think this is how Heisenberg compensators work. And then, and then, and then I would, you know, go and sure enough, there'd be a, a Reddit forum from five years ago that had that exact question and everybody else agreeing with me. I was like, well, we can't all be wrong, right? <laughs> it was a really fun and interesting process. Um, and one thing I do remember is like when we were talking about the, the nacelle shapes and the variable geometry as a sort of nod to Voyager and that technology kind of how that would evolve. 
Um, we, we did like the idea of it having a landing strut similar to Voyager to be able to do planetary landing as a smaller ship, almost like a cross halfway between a shuttlecraft and a, and a, a proper starship. Um, but also like when the, when the, the nacelles came down, it almost was like a bird with its wings settling down. It was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, that, that was the process. I tell you what I will say though, obviously with Prodigy being animation, you do then have almost more create creative license to be able to create something that you wouldn't be able to do in live action. I mean, as I said, I've watched quite a few episodes today and I keep going, oh, that's so pretty. Oh my God, look how good that is. And I guess it's, is it much different to planning how you would do something in live yeah. action or? Yeah, it is this kind of interesting like reverse engineering where there are a number of occasions where we could go hog wild <laughs> and and you know have it look like anything but we have to you know try to look at the design language and we sometimes we do find ourselves creating a 3D model <laughs> of that piece of plumbing hardware <laughs> in order to make it feel like a Star a Star Trek ship uh even though we literally it could be anything um, but similarly, you know, uh, as Lower Decks recently pointed out, and there, uh, there's that that caves mentality, right? Of like, a cave is a cave is a cave. So sometimes when we have to build a whole planet, um, or the inside of a board cube or something, and we're budgeted to only create one or two sets, so you you get creative and you create a set that can be shot from different angles, or you can take. Or you can take a hallway and turn it sideways or clone it or or angle it in such a way that it feels much bigger than it is. And it's almost like um, your set can be become 15 different sets if you're if you have enough imagination. And that that is, I think, something that we definitely carry over from the live action shows. Um, and that that uh, that's been re uh a, a fun and certainly interesting challenge, I think, for our team. Several people involved in the production, not naming names, but they all sort of go, if you're saying like, you know, oh, who's the biggest Trekkie? Walkie. Yeah, it's kind <laughs> of where that, you like, it, there's, there's there's not even a, a hesitation or something. So, you know, when it when it came to specifically Kobayashi, then you were thinking of, right, you've decided on who, who the characters are going to be. Did you just do all that unpaid? Did you just go like, right, I'm going to listen to all of this. So I'm really like, you know, pick out the best ones. I'm just going to dive down memory lane. Yeah, I mean, I it, there was a certain pride in craftsmanship, I suppose, in that there were, you know, with that particular project, uh, you know, there there was, as you hinted at, uh, a lot of sort of legacy audio that we decided to use. And then, you know, sometimes there's this, this misconception that... Uh, that that Star Trek shows are like oh they clearly have a department for that it's like no it was it was me <laughs> it's it like oh you're a poor assistant so it's like I have an assistant like <laughs> uh, and, and no it was it was um, in that case I it was sort of a, a pride of craftsmanship sort of thing I was like I wanted to make sure I got it right mm. and uh, and uh, you know, I, I think especially when you're trying to find bits of dialogue and kind of um, Frankenstein them together, you, sometimes you'll read something on a page and you're like, oh, that's the perfect line. But then you'll go back and into the actual episode and listen to it and they'll be like somebody picking up a coffee mug and clinking it or they're walking away from camera and they're and it doesn't doesn't sound right. So then you're like, OK, back to square one. So, yeah, in the end, I did wind up having to read about 70 or 80 scripts and rewatch top to bottom and 2x speed at least until i could find the uh the the episode uh the the line in the episode uh, about 30 or 40 episodes and it, you know it's not like it was it was hard but it, it, i was there's never a point where i was like why am i doing this it was like i have to do this because i have to get it right um because other people out there i think care about it this as much as i do so that, that's always been my attitude is like I, I don't mind putting in a little bit extra elbow grease if it makes the episode better that I, I sounds think... like sean doing citation observations uh... <laughs> go through it frame by frame and just zoom in a little bit and see if i can find any more easter eggs Brand, it's fine and i never miss any uh but... <laughs> all the time all the time <laughs> But um, I think we we did uh, we did a list a while back of um, basically unique episodes, and Kobayashi is on it because because of particularly Uhura and 
uh, Spock's lines. I mean, we spoke, I think the first time we ever spoke, we spoke about there wasn't the same recording technology then as there is today. It's not like you can just run it through a program and it sounds exactly the same as even the 90s. You had Odo, you know, um, I think some of Scotty's lines came from the movie. So possibly they were a bit cleaner, but still. So now what you've got is that because you can hear the difference, that episode has become a time capsule. It's become a little museum piece. Um, so for one, thank you for putting in the work, but also, I mean, you're right. As the Trekkies out there, we appreciate things like that because we now have a special episode in that respect. Yeah, uh, there was, I think towards the end of working on that episode, I was trying to do, um, figure out what sort of Spock's final lines would be. Um, and there, it was maybe just because it was late and I'd been <laughs> working on it all day, but I, but there was a sort of a, prof, a profound um, sort of um, moment for me as I was kind of putting the. I realized that all at, all the, all of his lines were kind of lining up in order, and there was like one line from every era of Leonard Nimoy's career leading all the way up to the end, and it, and you know his final "Live long and prosper." I went. I literally listened to every single time he ever said that. <laughs> which uh you know you would be surprised it's not as many as you would think um and it wasn't until i i found the last time he said it that it had that sort of that that profound profundity and that that gravitas that that was sort of like a this it it felt like a nice parallel in a way because i i was like oh there's a real chance that this may be the last time that um we hear Leonard Nimoy in Star Trek and I was and so I I took it very seriously but it, it you know for that very reason that you described that sort of time capsule thing is like I you know if nothing else I'm glad that people will get a chance to to hear everything that that these people brought to this series be, uh, this franchise because um it I think it means a lot to the people hearing it but also just to have their performances sort of uh um brought back for one last time for new audiences to see i think i, I took it um very seriously isn't that such a testament to how trekkies feel about star trek though that four words spoken by a character who cannot express emotion and yet you can still find one delivery that is packed full of emotion <laughs> right <laughs> and that's that's as much a testament to the actors as anything mm. you know because i i think that as numerous people have articulated, Vulcans are actually extremely hard to play. Because <laughs> I think, I think it's easy to think that they're oh, they're just like emotionless robots, but they're not. They're not like there. There's a there's a hints of sarcasm, hints of of genuine empathy, but it's behind this sort of like reserved mask almost. And to be able to do that, I think is that's as hard as playing Lear. <laughs> Um, I think just to reiterate that it's so nice to be able to talk about it with such positivity without that uncertainty now, as you said. It's so nice that now we can really just celebrate how wonderful the show is rather than having to kind of do that, but with a purpose to show networks how great it is. Now we can just go see, look, we told you, and we can really have a have a great celebration, which is what we've been saying all along. <laughs> yeah. Well, now now people can just now the next goal is to is to tell a friend and have that friend tell a friend and and let people know uh, to check out the show as soon as it drops on on Netflix. Uh, and you know, hopefully, you know our 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 little fan base will just keep growing because uh, that's my that, that I made this show for for you guys so. I, I when I say I, I mean I am part of a huge team of, of artists, and we all feel that way. Uh, like, and I I'm a fan. It was made by fans for fans, uh, and so we 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 genuinely hope that you love it. Speaking for myself, speaking for the team, it's it's fantastic, and can't wait to release every episode of ups and downs absolutely bricking myself knowing that you will be watching um it's a i tell you aaron it's a very strange it's a very strange position being like you know okay i'm gonna write a review he has my number he's gonna send me so much abuse if i get this wrong and he's right to do it no <laughs> no listen i i always say pe people are free to like or dislike whatever they want 
you know um that's that's the beauty of star trek if uh, if you like comedy episodes they're there if you like action episodes they're there if you like cerebral philosophical ruminations they're there too there's there's no right or wrong way to be a star trek fan in that way because you know they embrace everybody <laughs> That's kind of that's the best way to end the episode. I think you're right. I think you just you just kind of nailed it on the head. So, Aaron, thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. You know, just you're you're a gent, and you always have been. So, thank you very much. Happy birthday, prodigy, to you and to everyone on the team. Um, is there anything you'd like to shout out to the fandom? Um, you know, just keep an keep an ear out to keep those subspace frequencies tuned uh, uh, for more information on when the. The, the series uh, is going to drop on Netflix, season one, later this year, 2023, season two, 2024. Um, and, you know, once they drop, spread the word, have watch parties, make sure that everybody sees it, because this is this is the chance for uh, for, I, you know, our the, the world to finally uh, check it out. So um, we're excited. We hope you're excited. Um, and feel free to find the team. We have the writer's room, the at Trek Prodigy room, I think is what it's called, um, which is where on uh, at least on X slash Twitter, but you can find also find me at Good Aaron, um, G-O-O-D-A-A-R-O-N on all social media and the Hagemans are also on most social media. And we will we'll keep you updated if you wanna know uh, what's going on with Prodigy. Thank you so much for watching this abbreviated version of this podcast. Now, if you go to our audio platforms, you will get the full version of this podcast with this guest. So we really, really appreciate you subscribing to that. And you're just awesome and wonderful. Thank you so much.